And now chapter 6 of the Madhya Leela, The Liberation of Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda I offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Godachandra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who converted the hard-hearted Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, the reservoir of all bad logic, into a great devotee. All glories to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All glories to Lord Nityananda Prabhu. All glories to Advaitacharya. And all glories to the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. In ecstasy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went from Atharanala to the temple of Jagannath. After seeing Lord Jagannath, he became very restless due to love of Godhead. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went swiftly to embrace Lord Jagannath, but when he entered the temple, he was so overwhelmed with love of Godhead that he fainted on the floor. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fell down, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya happened to see him. When the watchman threatened to beat the Lord, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya immediately forbade him. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was very surprised to see the personal beauty of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as well as the transcendental transformations wrought on his body due to love of Godhead. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu remained unconscious for a long time. Meanwhile, the time for offering prasad to Lord Jagannath came, and the Bhattacharya tried to think of a remedy. While Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was unconscious, Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, with the help of the watchmen and some disciples, carried him to his home and laid him down in a very sanctified room. Examining the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya saw that his abdomen was not moving and that he was not breathing. Seeing his condition, the Bhattacharya became very anxious. The Bhattacharya then took a fine cotton swab and put it before the Lord's nostrils. When he saw the cotton move very slightly, he became hopeful. Sitting beside Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he thought, This is a transcendental ecstatic transformation brought about by love of Krishna. Upon seeing the sign of Sudipta Sattvika, or inflamed transformations, Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya could immediately understand the transcendental ecstatic transformation in the body of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Such a sign takes place only in the bodies of eternally liberated devotees. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya considered, The uncommon ecstatic symptoms of Adi Ruda Bhav are appearing in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is very wonderful. How are they possible in the body of a human being? When the Bhattacharya was thinking in this way, at his home, all the devotees of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, headed by Nityananda Prabhu, approached the Singhadvar, or the entrance door of the temple. There the devotees heard the people talking about a mendicant who had come to Jagannath Puri and had seen the deity of Jagannath. The people said that the sannyasi fell unconscious upon seeing the deity of Lord Jagannath. Because his consciousness did not return, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya took him to his home. 
Hearing this, the devotees could understand that they were speaking of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Just then, Sri Gopinath Acharya arrived. Gopinath Acharya was a resident of Nadia, the son-in-law of Visharad, and a devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He knew the true identity of his lordship. Gopinath Acharya had previously been acquainted with Mukunda Dutt, and when he saw him at Jagannath Puri, he was very astonished. When Mukunda Dutt met Gopinath Acharya, Mukunda Dutt offered obeisances unto him. After embracing Mukunda Dutt, Gopinath Acharya inquired about news of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mukunda Dutt replied, The Lord has already arrived here. We have come with him. As soon as Gopinath Acharya saw Nityananda Prabhu, he offered his obeisances unto him. In this way, meeting all the devotees, he asked about news of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again and again. Mukunda Dutt continued, After accepting the sannyas order, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to Jagannath Puri and has brought all of us with him. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left our company and walked ahead to see Lord Jagannath. We have just arrived and are now looking for him. From the talk of the people in general, we have guessed that the Lord is now at the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Upon seeing Lord Jagannath, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu became ecstatic and fell unconscious, and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya has taken him to his home in this condition. Just as I was thinking of meeting you by chance, we have actually met. First let us all go to the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Later we shall come to see Lord Jagannath. Hearing this and feeling very pleased, Gopinath Acharya immediately took all the devotees with him and approached the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Arriving at the home of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, everyone saw the Lord lying unconscious. Seeing him in this condition, Gopinath Acharya became very unhappy, but at the same time he was happy just to see the Lord. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya permitted all the devotees to enter his house, and upon seeing Nityananda Prabhu, the Bhattacharya offered him obeisances. Sarvabhoma met with all the devotees and offered them a proper welcome. They were all pleased to see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Bhattacharya then sent them all back to see Lord Jagannath, and he asked his own son, Chandaneshvar, to accompany them as a guide. Everyone was then very pleased to see the deity of Lord Jagannath. Lord Nityananda in particular was overwhelmed with ecstasy. When Lord Nityananda Prabhu nearly fainted, all the devotees caught him and steadied him. At that time, the priest of Lord Jagannath brought a garland that had been offered to the deity and offered it to Nityananda Prabhu. Everyone was pleased to receive this garland worn by Lord Jagannath. Afterwards, they all returned to the place where Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was staying. All of the devotees then began to loudly chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Just before noon, the Lord regained his consciousness. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu got up and very loudly chanted, Hari! Hari! Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya was very pleased to see the Lord regain consciousness, and he took the dust of the Lord's lotus feet. The Bhattacharya informed all of them, Please take your midday baths immediately. Today I shall offer you Mahaprasad, the remnants of food offered to Lord Jagannath. After bathing in the sea, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees returned very soon. The Lord then washed his feet and sat down on a carpet to take lunch. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya made arrangements to bring various kinds of Mahaprasad from the Jagannath temple. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then accepted lunch with great happiness.
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was offered special rice and first-class vegetables on golden plates. He thus took lunch in the company of his devotees. While Sarabhuma Bhattacharya personally distributed the prasad, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu requested him, Please give me only boiled vegetables. You can offer the cakes and other preparations made with condensed milk to all the devotees. Hearing this, the Bhattacharya folded his hands and spoke as follows. Today, all of you please try to taste the lunch just as Lord Jagannath accepted it. After saying this, he made them all eat the various cakes and condensed milk preparations. After feeding them, he offered them water to wash their hands, feet, and mouths. Begging permission from Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya then went with Gopinath Acharya to take lunch. After finishing their lunch, they returned to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Offering his obeisances to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, Namo Narayanaya, or I offer my obeisances to Narayan. In return, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Krishna Matiya Astu, or let your attention be on Krishna. Hearing these words, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya understood Lord Chaitanya to be a Vaishnav sannyasi. Sarvabhoma then said to Gopinath Acharya, I want to know Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's previous situation. Gopinath Acharya replied, There was a man named Jagannath who was a resident of Navadvip and whose surname was Mishra Purandara. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the son of that Jagannath Mishra and his former name was Vishrambar Mishra. He also happens to be the grandson of Nilambar Chakravarti. The Bhattacharya said, Nilambar Chakravati was a classmate of my father, Maheshpa Visharad. He knew him as such. Jagannath Mishma Purandra was respected by my father. Thus, because of their relationship with my father, I respect both Jagannath Mishra and Nilambar Chakravati. Hearing that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu belonged to the Nadia district, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya became very pleased and addressed the Lord as follows. You are naturally respectable. Besides, you are a sannyasi. Thus I wish to become your personal servant. As soon as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this from the Bhattacharya, he immediately remembered Lord Vishnu and began to speak humbly to him as follows. Because you are a teacher of Vedanta philosophy, you are the master of all the people in the world, and their well-wisher as well. You are also the benefactor of all kinds of sannyasis. I am a young sannyasi, and I actually have no knowledge of what is good and what is bad. Therefore, I am taking shelter of you and accepting you as my spiritual master. I have come here only to associate with you, and I am now taking shelter of you. Will you kindly maintain me in all respects? The incident that happened today was a great obstacle for me, but you have kindly relieved me of it. The Bhattacharya replied, Do not go alone to see the deity at Jagannath Temple. It is better that you go with me or my men. The Lord said, I shall never enter the temple, but shall always view the Lord from the side of the Garuda Stamba. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya then told Gopinath Acharya, Take Goswami and show him Lord Jagannath. Also, the apartment belonging to my maternal aunt is in a very solitary place. Make all arrangements for him to stay there. Thus Gopinath Acharya took Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the residential quarters and showed him where to find water, tubs and water pots. Indeed, he arranged everything. The next day, Gopinath Acharya took Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to see the early rising of Lord Jagannath. Gopinath Acharya then took Mukunda Dutt with him and went to Sarvabhoma's house. When they arrived, Sarvabhoma addressed Mukunda Dutt as follows. 
The sannyasi is very meek and humble by nature, and his person is very beautiful to see. Consequently, my affection for him increases. From which Sampradaya has he accepted the sannyas order, and what is his name? Gopinathacharya replied, The Lord's name is Sri Krishna Chaitanya, and his sannyas preceptor is the greatly fortunate Keshava Bharati. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya said, Sri Krishna is a very good name, but he belongs to the Bharati community. Therefore, he is a second-class sannyasi. Gopinathacharya replied, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does not rely on any external formality. There is no need for him to accept the sannyas order from a superior sampradaya. The Bhattacharya inquired, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is in his full-fledged youthful life. How can he keep the principles of sannyas? I shall continuously recite the Vedanta philosophy before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so that he may remain fixed in his renunciation and thus enter upon the path of monism. If Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would like... I could bring him into a first-class sampradaya by offering him saffron cloth and performing the reformatory process again. Gopinathacharya and Mukunda Dutt became very unhappy when they heard this. Gopinathacharya therefore addressed Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya as follows. My dear Bhattacharya, you do not know the greatness of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. All the symptoms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are found in Him to the highest degree. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is celebrated as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Those who are ignorant in this connection find the conclusion of knowledgeable men very difficult to understand. The disciples of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya retaliated. By what evidence do you conclude that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord? Gopinathacharya replied, The statements of authorized acharyas who understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead are proof. We derive knowledge of the Absolute Truth by logical hypothesis. One cannot attain real knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by such logical hypothesis and argument. One can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead only by His mercy, not by guesswork or hypothesis. If one receives but a tiny bit of the Lord's favor by dint of devotional service, he can understand the nature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, My Lord, if one is favored by even a slight trace of the mercy of your lotus feet, he can understand the greatness of your personality. But those who speculate in order to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead are unable to know you even though they continue to study the Vedas for many years. Then, addressing Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, You are a great scholar and teacher of many disciples. Indeed, there is no other scholar like you on earth. Nonetheless, because you are bereft of even a pinch of the Lord's mercy, you cannot understand Him, even though He is present in your home. (laughs) It is not your fault. It is the verdict of the scriptures. You cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead simply by scholarship. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya replied, My dear Gopinath Acharya, please speak with great care. What is the proof that you have received the mercy of the Lord? Knowledge of the Summum Bonum, the Absolute Truth, is evidence of the mercy of the Supreme Lord. You have seen the symptoms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu during his absorption in an ecstatic mood. Despite directly perceiving the symptoms of the Supreme Lord in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you cannot understand him. This is commonly called illusion. 
a person influenced by the external energy is called Bahimuka Jan, a mundane person, because despite his perception, he cannot understand the real substance. Hearing Gopinath Acharya say this, Sarvabhumabhattacharya smiled and began to speak as follows. We are just having a discussion among friends and considering the points described in the scriptures. Do not become angry. I am simply speaking on the strength of the Shastras. Please don't take any offense. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is certainly a great uncommon devotee, but we cannot accept him as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu because according to Shastra there is no incarnation in this age of Kali. Another name for Lord Vishnu is Triyug, because there is no incarnation of Lord Vishnu in Kali Yug. Indeed, this is the verdict of the revealed scriptures. Upon hearing this, Gopinath Acharya became very unhappy. He said to the Bhattacharya, You consider yourself the knower of all Vedic scriptures. Srimad Bhagavatam and Mahabharata are the two most important Vedic scriptures, but you have paid no attention to their statements. In Srimad Bhagavatam and Mahabharata, it is stated that the Lord appears directly, but you say that in this age there is no manifestation or incarnation of Lord Vishnu. In this age of Kali, there is no Lila avatar of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he is known as Triyug. That is one of his holy names. There is certainly an incarnation in every age, and such an incarnation is called the Yuga Avatar. But your heart has become so hardened by logic and argument that you cannot consider all these facts. In the Bhagavatam, Gargamuni said to Nanda Maharaj, In the past, your son has had bodies in three different colors, according to the age. These colors were white, red, and yellow. In this age, Dvaprayug, he has accepted a blackish body. And in the eleventh canto it is said, In the age of Kali, as well as in Dvaprayug, the people offer prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead by various mantras and observe the regulative principles of the supplementary Vedic literatures. Now please hear of this from me. In this age of Kali, those who are intelligent perform the congregational chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who appears in this age always describing the glories of Krishna. That incarnation is yellowish in hue, and is always associated with his plenary expansions and personal expansions, as well as devotees and associates. And in the Mahabharata it is said, the Lord has a golden complexion. Indeed, his entire body, which is very nicely constituted, is, it is like molten gold. Sandalwood pulp is smeared all over his body. He will take the fourth order of spiritual life, or sannyas, and will be very self-controlled. He will be distinguished from Mayavadi sannyasis, in that he will be fixed in devotional service, and will spread the Sankirtan movement. There is no need to quote so much evidence from the Shastras, for you are a very dry speculator. There is no need to sow seeds in barren land. When the Lord will be pleased with you, you will also understand these conclusions and will quote from the Shastras. The false arguments and philosophical word jugglery of your disciples are not faults of theirs. They have simply received the benediction of Mayavad philosophy. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is full of unlimited qualities, and whose different potencies bring about agreement and disagreement between disputants. Thus the illusory energy again and again covers the self-realization of both disputants. The Lord says in the Bhagavatam, in almost all cases, whatever learned Brahmins speak becomes accepted. Nothing is impossible for one who takes shelter of my illusory energy and speaks under her influence. After hearing this from Gopinathacharya, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, 
First go to the place where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is staying and invite him here with his associates. Ask him on my account. Take Jagannath Prasad and first give it to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates. After that, come back here and teach me well. Gopinath Acharya was the brother-in-law of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Therefore, their relationship was very sweet and intimate. Under the circumstances, Gopinath Acharya taught him by sometimes blaspheming him, sometimes praising him, and sometimes laughing at him. This had been going on for some time. Srila Mukunda Dat felt very satisfied to hear the conclusive statements of Gopinath Acharya, but he became very unhappy and angry to hear the statements put forward by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. According to the instructions of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, Gopinath Acharya went to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and invited him on the Bhattacharya's behalf. The Bhattacharya statements were discussed before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Gopinath Acharya and Mukunda Dutt disapproved of the Bhattacharya statements because they caused mental pain. Hearing this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Do not speak like that. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya has shown great affection and mercy towards me. Out of paternal affection for me, he wants to protect me and see that I follow the regulative principles of a sannyasi. What fault is there in this? The next morning, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya together visited the temple of Lord Jagannath. Both of them were in a very pleasant mood. When they entered the temple, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya offered Chaitanya Mahaprabhu a seat while he himself sat down on the floor out of due respect for a sannyasi. He then began to instruct Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu on Vedanta philosophy, and out of affection and devotion he spoke to the Lord as follows. Hearing the Vedanta philosophy is a sannyasi's main business. Therefore, without hesitation, you should study Vedanta philosophy, hearing it without cessation from a superior person. Lord Chaitanya replied, You are very merciful to me, and therefore I think it is my duty to obey your order. Thus, for seven days continuously, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu listened to the Vedanta philosophy expounded by Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. However, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not say anything and did not indicate whether it was right or wrong. He simply sat there and listened to the Bhattacharya. On the eighth day, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, You have been listening to the Vedanta philosophy from me continuously for seven days. You have simply been listening, fixed in your silence. You do not say whether you think it is right or wrong. I cannot know whether you are actually understanding Vedanta philosophy or not. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, <laughs> Well, I am a fool and consequently I do not study Vedanta Sutra. I am just trying to hear it from you because you have ordered me. Only for the sake of executing the duties of the renounced order of sannyas do I listen. Unfortunately, I cannot in the least understand the meaning you are presenting. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya replied, I accept that you do not understand, yet even one who does not understand inquires about the subject matter. You are hearing again and again, yet you keep silent. I cannot understand what is actually within your mind. I can understand the meaning of each sutra very clearly, but it is your explanations that have simply agitated my mind. The meaning of the verses in the Vedanta Sutra contain clear purports in themselves, but other purports you presented simply covered the meaning of the sutra very much like a cloud. You do not explain the direct meaning of the Brahma Sutras. Indeed, it appears that your business is to cover the real meaning. Vedanta Sutra is the summary of all the Upanishads. 
Therefore, whatever direct meaning is there in the Upanishads is also recorded in the Vedanta Sutra or Vyasa Sutra. For each verse, the direct meaning must be accepted without interpretation. However, you simply abandon the direct meaning and proceed with your imaginative interpretation. Although there is other evidence, the evidence given in the Vedic version must be taken as foremost. Vedic versions understood directly are first-class evidence. Conch shells and cow dung are nothing but the bones and the stool of some living entities, but according to the Vedic version they are both considered very pure. The Vedic statements are self-evident. Whatever is stated there must be accepted. If we interpret according to our own imagination, well, the authority of the Vedas is immediately lost. The Brahma Sutra compiled by Srila Vyasadeva is as radiant as the sun. One who tries to interpret its meaning simply covers that sunshine with a cloud. All Vedic literature and other literature that strictly follows the Vedic principles ascertain that the Supreme Brahman is the absolute truth, the greatest of all, and a feature of the Supreme Lord. Actually, the Supreme Absolute Truth is a person, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, full with all opulence. But you are trying to explain Him as impersonal and formless. Wherever there is an impersonal description in the Vedas, the Vedas mean to establish that everything belonging to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is transcendental and free of mundane characteristics. Whatever Vedic mantras describe the Absolute Truth impersonally only prove in the end that the Absolute Truth is a person. The Supreme Lord is understood in two features, impersonal and personal. Now if one considers the Supreme Personality of Godhead in both features, he can understand the Absolute Truth. He knows that the personal understanding is stronger because we see that everything is full of variety. No one can see anything that is not full of variety. Everything in the cosmic manifestation emanates from the Absolute Truth. It remains in the Absolute Truth, and after annihilation it again enters the Absolute Truth. The personal features of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are categorized in three cases, namely ablative, instrumental, and locative. When the Supreme Personality of Godhead wished to become many, he glanced over the material energy. Before the creation, there were no mundane eyes or mind. Therefore, the transcendental nature of the Absolute Truth's mind and eyes is confirmed. The word Brahman indicates the complete Supreme Personality of Godhead who is Sri Krishna. That is the verdict of all Vedic literature. The confidential meaning of the Vedas is not easily understood by common men. Therefore, that meaning is supplemented by the words of the Puranas. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Brahma said, How greatly fortunate are Nanda Maharaj, the cowherd men, and all the inhabitants of Rajbhumi. There is no limit to their fortune because the Absolute Truth, the source of transcendental bliss, the eternal Supreme Brahman, has become their friend. The Vedic Apani Pada Mantra rejects material hands and legs, yet it states that the Lord goes very fast and accepts everything offered to Him. All these mantras confirm that the Absolute Truth is personal, but the Mayavadis, throwing away the direct meaning, interpret the Absolute Truth as impersonal. Are you describing as formless that Supreme Personality of Godhead whose transcendental form is complete with six transcendental opulences? The Supreme Personality of Godhead has three primary potencies. Are you trying to ascertain that he has no potencies? In the Vishnu Purana it is stated, the internal potency of the Supreme Lord Vishnu is spiritual as verified by the Shastras. There is another spiritual potency known as Kshetra or the living entity. The third potency, which is known as Nescience, makes the living entity godless and fills him with fruit of activity. O King, the Kshetra Shakti is the living entity. Although he has the facility to live in either the material or spiritual world, 
he suffers the threefold miseries of material existence because he is influenced by the avidya or nescience potency which covers his constitutional position. This living entity, covered by the influence of nescience, exists in different forms in the material condition. O king, he is thus proportionately freed from the influence of material energy to greater or lesser degrees. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is Satchit Ananda Vigraha. This means that he originally has three potencies, the pleasure potency, the potency of eternality, and the potency of knowledge. Together these are called the Chit Potency, and they are present in full in the Supreme Lord. For the living entities who are part and parcel of the Lord, the pleasure potency in the material world is sometimes displeasing and sometimes mixed. This is not the case with the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he is not under the influence of the material energy or its modes. The Supreme Personality of Godhead in his original form is full of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. The spiritual potency in these three portions assumes three different forms. The three portions of the spiritual potency are called Ladini or the bliss portion, Sandini or the eternity portion, and Samvit or the knowledge portion. We accept knowledge of these as full knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The spiritual potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead also appears in three phases, internal, marginal, and external. These are all engaged in His devotional service in love. In His spiritual potency, the Supreme Lord enjoys six kinds of opulence. You do not accept this spiritual potency, and this is due to your great impudence. The Lord is the master of the potencies, and the living entity is the servant of them. That is the difference between the Lord and the living entity. However, you declare that the Lord and the living entities are one and the same. In Bhagavad Gita, the living entity is established as the marginal potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yet you say that the living entity is completely different from the Lord. Krishna himself says, Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego are my eightfold separated energies. Besides these inferior energies, which are material, there is another energy, a spiritual energy, and this is the living being, O mighty armed one. The entire material world is sustained by the living entities. The transcendental form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is complete in eternity, cognizance, and bliss. However, you describe this transcendental form as a product of material goodness. One who does not accept the transcendental form of the Lord is certainly an agnostic. Such a person should be neither seen nor touched. Indeed, he is subject to be punished by Yamaraj. The Buddhists do not recognize the authority of the Vedas, therefore they are considered agnostics. However, those who have taken shelter of the Vedic scriptures, yet preach agnosticism in accordance with the Mayavad philosophy, are certainly more dangerous than the Buddhists. Srila Vyasadeva presented the Vedanta philosophy for the deliverance of conditioned souls, but if one hears the commentary of Sankaracharya, everything is spoiled. The Vedanta Sutra aims at establishing that the cosmic manifestation has come into being by the transformation of the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The touchstone, after touching iron, produces volumes of gold without being changed. Similarly, the Supreme Personality of Godhead manifests Himself as the cosmic manifestation by His inconceivable potency, yet He remains unchanged in His eternal, transcendental form. Shankaracharya's theory states that the Absolute Truth is transformed. 
By accepting this theory, the Mayavadi philosophers denigrate Srila Vyasadeva by accusing him of error. They thus find fault in the Vedanta Sutra and interpret it to try to establish the theory of illusion. The theory of illusion can be applied only when the living entity identifies himself with the body. As far as the cosmic manifestation is concerned, it cannot be called false, although it is certainly temporary. The transcendental vibration, Omkar, is the sound form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All Vedic knowledge and this cosmic manifestation are produced from this sound representation of the Supreme Lord. The subsidiary vibration, Tat Tvam Asi, which means you are the same, is meant for the understanding of the living entity. But the principal vibration is Omkar. Not caring for Omkar, Shankaracharya has stressed the vibration Tat Tvam Asi. Thus Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu criticized Shankaracharya's Sharidaka Basya as imaginary, and he pointed out hundreds of faults in it. To defend Shankaracharya, however, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya presented unlimited opposition. The Bhattacharya presented various types of false arguments with pseudo-logic and tried to defeat his opponent in many ways. However, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu refuted all these arguments and established his own conviction. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continued, The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the central point of all relationships. Acting in devotional service to Him is one's real occupation and the attainment of love of Godhead is the ultimate goal of life. These three subject matters are described in Vedic literature. If one tries to explain the Vedic literature in a different way, he is indulging in imagination. Any interpretation of the self-evident Vedic version is simply imaginary. Actually, there is no fault on the part of Shankaracharya. He simply carried out the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He had to imagine some kind of interpretation, and therefore he presented a kind of Vedic literature that is full of atheism. Addressing Lord Shiva, the Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Please make the general populace averse to me by imagining your own interpretation of the Vedas. Also cover me in such a way that people will take more interest in advancing material civilization just to propagate a population bereft of spiritual knowledge. Lord Shiva informed the goddess Durga, the superintendent of the material world, In the age of Kali, I take the form of a Brahmin and explain the Vedas through false scriptures in an atheistic way, similar to Buddhist philosophy. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya became very astonished upon hearing this. He became stunned and said nothing. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then told him, Do not be astonished. Actually, devotional service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the highest perfection of human activity. Even the self-satisfied sages perform devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Such are the transcendental qualities of the Lord. They are full of inconceivable spiritual potency. Those who are self-satisfied and unattracted by external material desires are also attracted to the loving service of Sri Krishna, whose qualities are transcendental and whose activities are wonderful. Hari, the Personality of Godhead is called Krishna because he has such transcendentally attractive features. After hearing the Atmaram verse, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya addressed Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. My dear sir, please explain this verse. I have a great desire to hear your explanation of it. The Lord replied, First, let me hear your explanation. After that, I shall try to explain what little I know. 
Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya then began to explain the Atmaram verse, and according to the principles of logic, he raised various premises. The Bhattacharya explained the Atmaram verse in nine different ways on the basis of scripture. After hearing his explanation, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, smiling a little, began to speak. My dear Bhattacharya, you are exactly like Brihaspati, the priest of the heavenly kingdom. Indeed, no one within this world has the power to explain the scriptures in such a way. My dear Bhattacharya, you have certainly explained this verse by the prowess of your vast learning. But you should know that, besides this scholarly explanation, there is another purport to this verse. Upon the request of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began to explain the verse without touching upon the nine explanations given by the Bhattacharya. There are eleven words in the Atmaram verse, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained each word one after the other. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took each word specifically and combined it with the word Atmaram. He thus explained the word Atmaram in eighteen different ways. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, The Supreme Personality of Godhead, His different potencies and His transcendental qualities all have inconceivable prowess. It is not possible to explain them fully. These three items attract the mind of a perfect student engaged in spiritual activities and overcome all of the processes of spiritual activity. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained the meaning of the verse by giving evidence concerning Shukdev Goswami and the four rishis, Sanak, Sanat Kumara, Sanatan, and Sanandan. Thus the Lord gave various meanings and explanations. Upon hearing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's explanation of the Atmaram verse, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was struck with wonder. He then understood Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be Krishna in person, and he thus condemned himself in the following words, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is certainly Lord Krishna himself, because I could not understand him and was very proud of my own learning I have committed many offenses. When Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya denounced himself as an offender and took shelter of the Lord, the Lord desired to show him mercy. To show him mercy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu allowed him to see his Vishnu form. Thus, he immediately assumed four hands. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu first showed him the four-handed form and then appeared before him in his original form of Krishna with a blackish complexion and a flute to his lips. When Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya saw the form of Lord Krishna manifested in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he immediately fell down flat to offer him obeisances. Then he stood up and with folded hands began to offer prayers. By the mercy of the Lord, all truths were revealed to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya and he could understand the importance of chanting the holy name and distributing love of Godhead everywhere. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya composed 100 verses in a very short time. Indeed, not even Brihaspati, the priest of the heavenly planets, could compose verses as quickly. After hearing the 100 verses, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu happily embraced Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was immediately overwhelmed in ecstatic love of Godhead and fell unconscious. Out of ecstatic love of God, the Bhattacharya shed tears and his body was stunned. 
He exhibited an ecstatic mood, and he perspired, shook, and trembled. He sometimes danced, sometimes chanted, and sometimes cried, and sometimes fell down to touch the lotus feet of the Lord. While Sarvabhumabhatacharya was in this ecstasy, Gopinathacharya was very pleased. The associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all laughed to see the Bhattacharya dance so. Gopinathacharya told Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sir, you have brought all this upon Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, You are a devotee. Because of your association, Lord Jagannath has shown him mercy. After this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu pacified the Bhattacharya. And when he was quieted, he offered many prayers to the Lord. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya said, My dear sir, you have delivered the entire world, but that is not a very great task. However, you have delivered me, and that is certainly the work of very wonderful powers. I had become dull-headed due to reading too many books on logic. Consequently, I have become like an iron bar. Nonetheless, you have melted me, and therefore your influence is very, very great. After hearing the prayers offered by Sarvamoma Matacharya, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned to his residence, and the Bhattacharya through Gopinath Acharya, induced the Lord to accept lunch there. the following morning, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to see Lord Jagannath in the temple, and he saw the Lord rise from his bed. The priest there presented him with garlands and prasad that had been offered to Lord Jagannath. This pleased Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very much. Carefully tying the prasad and garlands in a cloth, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu hastened to the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. He arrived at the Bhattacharya's house a little before sunrise, just when the Bhattacharya was arising from bed. As Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya arose from bed, he distinctly chanted, Krishna, Krishna. Lord Chaitanya was very pleased to hear him chant the holy name of Krishna. <laughs> The Bhattacharya noticed Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu outside, and with great haste he went to him and offered prayers unto his lotus feet. The Bhattacharya offered a carpet for the Lord to sit upon, and both of them sat there. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu opened the prasad and placed it in the hands of the Bhattacharya. At that time the Bhattacharya had not even washed his mouth, nor had he taken his bath nor finished his morning duties. Nonetheless, he was very pleased to receive the prasad of Lord Jagannath. By the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the dullness in the mind of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was eradicated. After reciting the following two verses, he ate the prasad offered to him. The Bhattacharya said, One should eat the Maha Prasad of the Lord immediately upon receiving it, even though it is dried up, stale, or brought from a distant country. One should consider neither time nor place. As stated in the Padma Purana, the prasad of Lord Krishna is to be eaten by a gentleman as soon as it is received. 
There should be no hesitation. There are no regulative principles concerning time and place. This is the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very pleased to see this. He became ecstatic in love of Godhead and embraced Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. The Lord and the servant embraced one another and began to dance. Simply by touching each other, they became ecstatic. As they danced and embraced, spiritual symptoms manifested in their bodies. They perspired, trembled, and shed tears, and the Lord began to speak in His ecstasy. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Today I have conquered the three worlds very easily. Today I have ascended to the spiritual world. I think that today all my desires have been fulfilled because I see that Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya has acquired faith in the Mahaprasad of Lord Jagannath. Indeed, today you have undoubtedly taken shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, and Krishna, without reservation, has become very, very merciful toward you. My dear Bhattacharya, today you have been released from material bondage in the bodily conception of life. You have cut to pieces the shackles of the illusory energy. Today your mind has become fit to take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna because, surpassing the Vedic regulative principles, you have eaten the remnants of food offered to the Lord. When a person without reservation takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the unlimited merciful Lord bestows His causeless mercy upon him. Thus one can pass over the insurmountable ocean of nescience. Those whose intelligence is fixed in the bodily conception, who think, I am this body, are fit food for dogs and jackals. The Supreme Lord never bestows His mercy upon such people. After speaking to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya in this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned to his residence. From that day on, the Bhattacharya was free because his false pride had been dismantled. From that day on, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya did not know anything but the lotus feet of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and from that day he could explain the revealed scriptures only in accordance with the process of devotional service. Seeing that Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was firmly fixed in the cult of Vaishnavism, Gopinath Acharya, his brother-in-law, began to dance, clap his hands, and chant, Hari! Hari! The next day, the Bhattacharya went to visit the temple of Lord Jagannath. But before he reached the temple, he went to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When he met Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Bhattacharya fell down flat to offer him his respects. After offering various prayers to him, he spoke of his previous bad disposition with great humility. Then the Bhattacharya asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which item is most important in the execution of devotional service? The Lord replied that the most important item was the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. In this age of quarrel and hypocrisy, the only means of deliverance is the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very elaborately explained the Hare Nam verse of the Brihan Naradiya Purana, and Sarabhoma Bhattacharya was struck with wonder to hear his explanation. Gopinath Acharya reminded Sarabhoma Bhattacharya, My dear Bhattacharya, what I foretold to you has now taken place. Offering his obeisances to Gopinath Acharya, the Bhattacharya said, because I am related to you, and you are a devotee, 
By your mercy, the Lord has shown mercy to me. You are a first-class devotee, whereas I, <laughs> I am in the darkness of logical arguments. Because of your relationship with the Lord, the Lord has bestowed his benediction upon me. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very pleased with this humble statement. After embracing the Bhattacharya, he said, Now go see Lord Jagannath in the temple. After visiting the temple of Lord Jagannath, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya returned home with Jagannananda and Damodar. The Bhattacharya brought large quantities of excellent food remnants blessed by Lord Jagannath. All this prasad was given to his own Brahmin servant along with Jagadananda and Damodar. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya then composed two verses on the leaf of a palm tree. Giving the palm leaf to Jagadananda Prabhu, he requested him to deliver it to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Jagadananda and Damodar then returned to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, bringing him both the prasad and the palm leaf on which the verses were composed. But Mukunda Dutt took the palm leaf from the hands of Jagadananda before he could deliver it to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mukunda Dutt then copied the two verses on the wall outside the room. After this, Jagadananda took the palm leaf from Mukunda Dutt and delivered it to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. As soon as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu read the two verses, he immediately tore up the palm leaf. However, all the devotees read these verses on the outside wall, and they all kept them within their hearts. The verses read as follows. Let me take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna who has descended in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach us real knowledge, his devotional service and detachment from whatever does not foster Krishna consciousness. He has descended because he is an ocean of transcendental mercy. Let me surrender unto his lotus feet. Let my consciousness, which is like a honeybee, take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who has just now appeared as Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach the ancient system of devotional service to himself. This system had almost been lost due to the influence of time. These two verses composed by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya will always declare his name and fame as loudly as a pounding drum because they have become pearl necklaces around the necks of all devotees. Indeed, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya became an unalloyed devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He did not know anything but the service of the Lord. The Bhattacharya always chanted the holy name of Sri Krishna Chaitanya, son of Mother Shachi, and reservoir of all good qualities. Indeed, chanting the holy names became his meditation. One day Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya came before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and, offering obeisances, began to recite a verse. He began to quote one of Lord Brahma's prayers from the Srimad Bhagavatam, but he changed two syllables at the end of the verse. The verse read, One who seeks your compassion and thus tolerates all kinds of adverse conditions due to the karma of his past deeds, who engages always in your devotional service with his mind, words, and body, and who always offers obeisances unto you, 
is certainly a bona fide candidate for becoming your unalloyed devotee. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu immediately pointed out, in that verse the word is Mukti Pade, but you have changed it to Bhakti Pade. What is your intention? Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya replied, The awakening of pure love of Godhead, which is the result of devotional service, far surpasses liberation from material bondage. For those averse to devotional service, merging into the Brahman effulgence is a kind of punishment. The impersonalists who do not accept the transcendental form of Lord Sri Krishna and the demons who are always engaged in blaspheming and fighting with him are punished by being merged into the Brahmin effulgence. But that does not happen to the person engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. There are five kinds of liberation. Salokya, Samipya, Sarupya, Shashti, and Sayuja. If there is a chance to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, a pure devotee sometimes accepts the Salokya Sarupya, Samipya, or Sarsti forms of liberation, but never Sayusha, or merging into the Lord's effulgence. A pure devotee does not like even to hear about Sayusha Mukti, which inspires him with fear and hatred. Indeed, the pure devotee would rather go to hell than merge into the effulgence of the Lord. There are two kinds of Sayusha Mukti. Merging into the Brahmin effulgence, and merging into the personal body of the Lord. Merging into the Lord's body is even more abominable than merging into his effulgence. Even though he is offered all kinds of liberation, the pure devotee does not accept them. He is fully satisfied engaging in the service of the Lord. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, The word Muktipad has another meaning. Muktipad directly refers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All kinds of liberation exist under the feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he is known as Muktipad. According to another meaning, Mukti is the ninth subject, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the shelter of liberation. Since I can understand Krishna according to these two meanings, what point is there in changing the verse? Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya replied, I was not able to give that reading to the verse. Although your explanation is correct, it should not be used because there is ambiguity in the word muktipad. The word mukti refers to five kinds of liberation. Usually its direct meaning conveys the idea of becoming one with the Lord. The very sound of the word mukti immediately induces hate and fear. But when we say the word bhakti, we naturally feel transcendental bliss within the mind. Upon hearing this explanation, the Lord began to laugh and with great pleasure immediately embraced Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya very firmly. Indeed, that very person who was accustomed to reading and teaching Mayabad philosophy was now even hating the word mukti. This was possible only by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. As long as it does not turn iron into gold by its touch, no one can recognize an unknown stone to be a touchstone. Upon seeing transcendental Vaishnavism in Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, everyone could understand that Lord Chaitanya was none other than the son of Nanda Maharaj, Krishna. After this incident, all the inhabitants of Jagannath Puri, headed by Kashi Mishra, came to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Later I shall describe how Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya always engaged in the service of the Lord. I shall also describe in full detail how Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya perfectly rendered service to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by offering him alms. If one hears with faith and love these pastimes concerning Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's meeting with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he very soon is freed from the net 
of speculation and fruitive activity and attains the shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet. Praying at the lotus feet of Sri Rupa and Sri Raghunath, always desiring their mercy, I, Krishnadas, narrate Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita following in their footsteps. <laughs> This ends Chapter 6 of the Madhya Leela, The Liberation of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya.